So our passage today is Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. And some of you might say, but pastor, you preached on this before. Yes, I have. This is one of three passages on the spiritual gifts. And a couple years ago, I went through the whole series. And every year, I teach a class on the spiritual gifts. And uh, one of the things I've done, or we've done today in your bulletin, is you have a uh, calendar, right, for the whole year. Now, the reason we did this is, I told my Tuesday class, going deeper class, that I wanted to title this sermon, No Excuses. And uh, they said, well, that might not be taken very well. <laughs> so we're gonna, working together to build the church. And one of the reasons that we gave you this is so that when you get home today, you can, if you're a digital person, you can put it into your digital calendar. If you are a... If you're a person who has a, has a planner or a calendar, you can put all of these dates up on your, up on your calendar. So, because you know, one of the things I hear is, oh man, I really wanted to be at church at the farm, but I had this other thing. Now you can be first on the calendar for church at the farm. So uh, we're going to be having two of them this year uh, instead of three. And we are going to have, we're, we're finally able to have a church in the park we haven't had one for three years because the parks weren't available, but we are going to be the first church to hold a service in the new renovated Monteith Park. And we're going to have a baptismal service in the river. I'm looking forward to that. But you have those calendars in there for a reason. I want you to be excited about 2024. 2024 is going to be a year for us to say, God, what do you want me to do? One more, right? Just one more. You need to, and where are they? They're out there. And it's our job as a church to work together to do that. Follow, it says, Jesus said, follow me. He said, I am going to go before you and take those works out there, out into the world. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and let's listen to what, he ha what God has to say, what Paul tells us here. And if you're one of those people who don't mind underlining in your Bible, and you can keep up with this because this is going to be fast, I want you to underline the two words. One, the word one, and the second one is all. Two very important words in this passage that apply to us. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience showing tolerance to one another in love, being diligent to persevere the uni to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just also as we are called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, I, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers 
for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the statute which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. <coughs> Excuse me. As we look at this passage, it's amazing to me how God puts it all together. If we looked at all three of the passages, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, and we looked at all of the gifts, in every one of them, God says, I give each one a gift. Do you realize, sitting in here, I, I really wish, you know, you know you, the, in the cartoons, you know where they have the little bubbles? I would love it if the Holy Spirit would come down and put little bubbles above everybody head, everybody's head and says, this is what your gift is. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, you'd go, oh, yeah, thank you, God. Now I know what my spiritual gift is. But God gives us all a gift every one of us and we are all in this together we're all in this together sometimes uh you know people call up and they'll say oh hey hey pastor uh i think the church ought to do this and or i or usually it's, it's said like this i think we need to do this right you ever had this discussion I have this discussion with a lot of folks. You know, we need to do this. And the question is, who's the we? Right? It, it, are, when you say we, do you mean me and you? Or do you mean you and somebody else? But nine times out of ten, you know what it means? You. <laughs> we need to do this and, and you need to, Right? And see, God says, I gave you all gifts. One of the most exciting things that happens for me is when people come into my office and they say, Pastor, I really think we need to have this ministry. And then I'll say, okay, I'm right behind you. I'm your number one supporter. As long as it's going to grow the body of Christ. And they're, they, they get these big eyes. And I say, you know what? The worst that can happen is it fails and we know one thing that didn't work. But when God is behind it, you know what I see? I see God opening up people's hearts and they're like going, oh man, you know, it's kind of fun when, when people, you know, they get in way over their head, right? And they're, they're like, okay, I'm going to teach a Sunday school class of third graders, and you think, oh, Sunday school class for third graders, no problem. <laughs> right? I see there's a few people who have taught third grade Sunday school class. My first year in college up in Portland, we had to have a, we had to have a Christian service, and I found this little church just a couple blocks from the, a couple blocks from the, the uh, school, and so I started going there, and, and they, I said, how can I, you know, I have to do Christian service. What can I do? We have a need for a teacher for third grade boys. Now, I'd been a third grade boy, and I had a really good teacher, Miss Christine McKinney. So I thought, oh, yeah, I can do this. 
First week, two boys showed up. And my, my Bible, my, my Sunday school story made it about 15 minutes. And they had a long-winded preacher. Took it, you know, so I'm like, okay. So you know what it made me do? I had to go study harder to teach those third grade boys. Because you realize third grade boys ask a lot of questions. But what about this? Oh, yeah. Miss Emberly, do you ask mama questions? Amen. Yeah, they ask a lot of questions. And a lot of times when we get into the middle and, and, and decide that we're, we're going to jump into the middle of helping, jump into the middle of discipling somebody, jump into the middle of a Sunday school class, it drives us deeper. Because we're in this together. And, and, you know, the other thing that happens a lot of times is, is we have some really good ministries in this church. We really do. We have something from, from all the way down to the cradle in our nursery all the way up to our golden heirs. You know, from, from zero to a hundred, literally. Because we have, we have a hundred-year-old here in this church. And a lot of times what we, what we think is, oh, Oh, we have a good ministry. I'll take care. We'll take care of our, our little group here. Well, I got news for you. That isn't what God says. You know, okay, you guys are the left half of the body. You guys go do what you want to do, and you're the right half of the body, right? Doesn't work that way, does it? Everybody has to work together. Guys, I got news for you. Men's ministry... You have as much responsibility for the ladies' ministry as they do. Oh, I didn't hear any amens on that. <laughs> At least no male amens. Well, ladies, I got news for you. Ladies, the women's ministry has as much responsibility for the men's ministry as they do. You see, we have a responsibility for each other. Golden heirs, I got news for you. You have a big, as big a responsibility for our youth group as our youth group has for you guys. Because, you see, we can't do it without each other. We all have a responsibility. And the biggest responsibility is that all of us have a responsibility for our children. We have a responsibility for our children. It doesn't matter whether you're in Golden Airs or, or whether you're in, in our junior high high school. Everybody in between. You may not even be in a group. We all have a responsibility. And, and you know, I absolutely love it when I see a... a, a a, one of the kids coming through church, usually they're, they're round in the corner hitting third gear, right? And, and somebody's going, them kids shouldn't be running around. Yeah. And I go, it's okay. Wouldn't you rather have them here than down at the mall? Wouldn't you rather have them in here where people love them and teach them about God than somebody down there teaching them how to how to do Mario Andretti or whatever the latest game is, or locked into a screen? Absolutely. And a matter of fact, that's one of Jesus' things. You know, Jesus had things, right? He had, he had things that he really thought was important. One of those things was kids. There, there was one day when the apostles were, they were all like, uh, we're... For those who didn't know, when I was in college, I worked my way through college working for the police department on campus, and for a number of years, I was Jerry Falwell's bodyguard. I did that for a number of years, and, and you know, what it's, part of my job was to watch people and screen people as they came close. You know, you're always watching, do people have their hands in their pocket, what's going on? And, and uh, the apostles were kind of like that. They wanted to protect Jesus. And so, so there were times when they'd say, oh, keep those people away. 
In Matthew 19, it says, And then some children were brought to him so that they might lay his hands on them and pray. Ooh, don't you love that? I love that. I love praying over kids. Right? The disciples rebuked them, and Jesus said, Let the children alone, and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Bring them. Man, they may have, they may have, you know, lollipop down the side of their face. But if one of those little ones comes, they, you know, scoop them up, love on them. Become the teacher that they need. You know, we have Awanas every Wednesday night, and Jerry and Wendy and the, the, has a great crew, but they need people. And you say, well, I'm too old. Are you too old to sit and listen to a four or five-year-old repeat scripture? Or, or look at their book and see how they've done? That takes no effort. And I tell you what, it excites me to know in little cadence. I, I missed, <laughs> he's five. I said he was four last service. I got, I got rebuked on that. He's five. <clears throat> but little Cadence comes into my office the other day. There he is. Hi, buddy. Yeah. Little Cadence comes into my office the other day, and he tells me the plan of salvation. Five years old. Do I love that? Oh, absolutely. I'm going to cheer that on as much as I can. Matter of fact, Jesus was so much into this he, he said something else in Matthew 18. And whoever receives such a child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to stumble, it would be better to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I think Jesus loves kids. I, I, I pray you know, when we redid that gym floor a few years ago, the one thing I was praying is, okay, God, now fill it up with kids. I would have dreams. Literally, I would have dreams of that gymnasium filled up with kids running around so loud you couldn't hear yourself think. And I think God's going to do that. God's gonna, God is going to honor that because God loves the children. And we all have a responsibility to raise those children to become children of God. You know, we have some other responsibilities. We have some young couples in our church. We got some young couples that have just gotten saved in our church recently. And you know what they need? They need some older couples. They need some older couples to come alongside and, and show them what it means to be married for years. And it's not easy. You know, it's not to live happily ever after. This next year, we're going to, one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be giving you an opportunity to, to, be, uh, to build work on your marriages. And, and the first one is going to come up in March. Uh, Adventures in Marriage is coming to Albany. And we want you to be part of that. But out of that, we also want to have several couples that will, will become marriage mentors that will come alongside younger couples and show them what it means to, to have a godly Marriage. You see, it's all together. It's all together. We all have a job to do. Well, the other thing is that it says that the five ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, the five ministries are there for the equipping of the saints. The staff and elders here at Eastside are here to help you. We're, we're not going to 
we're not just going to abandon you, but our job is to help you the best way we can. We, we don't have the capacity to do everything that everybody asks. But we do have the capacity to help you do what you want to do better. And so we want to come alongside of you. And God has given us these five gifts. <coughs> Excuse me. He, he's given us these five gifts. The first one he starts out with, isn't it amazing that he starts out with apostles? Now the word apostles, if you'll remember, means sent one. And so quite commonly we, we note this as our missionaries. Now we don't, we don't have a missions pastor here, but we have an amazing missions program. We give about 12% of our budget goes to missions. But I have news for you. We double that in special giving. We also, every year, we send a team somewhere. This year we're going back to Ecuador. If you'll remember, last year we sent a team down to Ecuador. We sent down $25,000 to build the foundation for the forever home. The forever home now it has all two stories are built up. We have a roof on. This summer they're going to complete the ground floor. And in September we're going to be taking a team back for two weeks to work on the second floor to finish it out so that these kids will have their forever home. This, this church is amazing. I was over, we were delivering, we did 600 boxes to, uh, to Operation Christmas Child this last year. And I was, oh, the, there's only one church in Albany that brought more boxes, and they're twice our size. And they brought 700. To know that this church sent out 600 boxes around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are an amazing church, and that's important because it gets us outside of ourselves. If you ever take a trip to one of our missions, you're going to realize how blessed we are here. I mean, it, it amazes me what God does with what we give. But we have, we have an, an amazing missions program here. We, and the next one is profit. Well, that's what, that's what I do. Not now. This is not the prophet that's going to tell you that on next Tuesday there's, you know. No, it's speaking forth the truth. That's my job. My job is to make the word of God come alive in your life. That's why you will never see me. I'm not going to preach out of a book. I'm not going to say, oh, I read this really good book and you guys need to, uh, you know. It will be out of this book and this book alone. As we, as we that's my job. When, we, when you hear me say, uh, we're going to have a spiritual maturity class, that class comes directly out of the Word of God. We're going to, it's coming up in February and, uh, and for four weeks on Sunday night, if you want to come, we'll give you the four habits that it takes. And every one of them comes out of the word of God. When, when I teach, I believe it's in April that I'm going to be teaching the, uh, the discovering your spiritual maturity or discovering your spiritual gifts class. If you come to that class, we're going to go through what does the Bible say about your spiritual gift. We're not going to have some little gimmick that you go on the computer and you type in five, answer five questions and it tells you what your spiritual gift is. We're going to see what the Bible says about your word. That's my job. My job is the, to preach the word. The next one is evangelists. And we have, we have several people here that are truly evangelists. They are people who are constantly looking for people who are seekers. And we have people sitting here 
today that, are, that came to Christ because we have people who are constantly looking for new believers. I see some elbows going on here. Amen? Amen. And then we have pastors and teachers. Pastors are our elders. They're our overseers. They're our shepherds. Our, our, our elders here are, don't just sit in, uh, have elders meetings and sit around and, and say, oh, let's, let's spend our money here, there, and the other place. Matter of fact, we have two elders meetings a month, and one of those is strictly for prayer, for intercession, and for, for us to grow. So we, we spend time in the Bible, what is going on in our church that we need to strengthen ourselves as elders. But, but their primary focus is you, to shepherd you. And then finally, teachers. And we have some of the best teachers I've ever seen in this church. We, we have David Vandenberg's class right now on Revelation has, you, you will not find a finer class, and I would put it up against any seminary class on Revelation. David's an amazing teacher. And, and God has given us all of this, but what is it here for? It's for you. It's for you then to take that and go do something with it. Take it out into there, as we would say. So, and this is not, this was a precedent in the very first church that was ever founded. In Acts chapter 6, they had a problem. They, they were growing so fast that some people got forgotten. In verse, uh, chapter, Acts 6, 1 through 5, now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose among the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their were, widows were being overlooked in the daily service of food. And so the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom you may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicantor, Timon, Paramaeus, Nicholas, a, disciple, a proselyte from Antioch. Notice the pattern. The people came to the, to the elders, to the apostles. They were the first elders of the church. They came to them with a problem. And they probably said, fix it. And you know what, the, what they did? They said, you fix it. Notice that it says that they went, they told them, you go pick seven. They didn't say, oh, well, well, we'll form a committee and we'll have an application process and we'll then review everybody. He said, no, you know the people who are involved in your, in, in your ministries out there. You know who they are and they picked, they picked seven. The people did. The congregation did. It wasn't a committee. It wasn't the apostles. The congregation chose those 12. And if you... If you ever have the chance to read it, almost all of the seven have Greek names. They picked Greek people to fix a Greek problem. Because they knew who it was. And notice who they picked, Stephen, a man full of, holy, of the Holy Spirit. You know who the people are that can minister in. You know in, in amongst yourselves. You see, we have people, somebody came to me a while back and said, hey, you know, we've, we've had some, several families come to Christ and, and, and uh, are, the, are the elders appointing people to, uh, to disciple them? 
And I'm like, I, I said, well, really what needs to happen is the people who are involved with them already need to be the ones that are discipling them. I said, if you have somebody that you you're have in mind, start. And, and the interesting thing that happens is it's, when it's a challenge, then you have to learn yourself. We have, a, we have a thing here called uh, 52 letters. So when you get baptized, uh, you get a letter every week. I see some heads shaking. Some of the folks are getting those 52 letters. And everyone is a, a, for one year. And some of them are pretty deep, right, Sandy? Some of them are pretty hard to understand. So it takes somebody to come alongside and, and take that and say, oh, well, this is, this is uh, well, let's look at it together. Because quite often, people get caught and, and, and they don't know what sanctification is or justification. So they're learning themselves. But we have this obligation to come alongside. We're the... the the object is for us to fix our own problems. We need to turn expectations into participation. Because, uh, you know, you can come and, and say, oh, pastor, we need to do this. Okay, who's the we, right? Who's the we? And we turn it into participation. All right? If, if I see the problem, then I have a pretty good idea of what needs to happen. I need to be part of that. Because God gives each one of us a spiritual gift and he expects us to use it. Isn't that interesting? He expects us to use it. When we... If we come in Ephesians chapter 4, when we come to verse 16, it says, And from the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You see, I, I love the fact that it uses this idea of the joints. Anybody here resemble Rice Krispies? You get up in the morning and you go snap, crackle, pop. I remember when, uh, uh, for those who don't know, a couple years back I had my knee replaced. I had had an injury uh, while I was a police officer and, and blew my knee up and finally the arthritis got so bad uh, that the doctor needed to fix it. But before then, I mean, I was, my, my regular doctor said, well, let's see if we can put it off for a little bit. And I was eating, eating a leave like it was candy. And, and my whole body reacted. Because, you know, because this was bad, this, was, this started hurting. And I started, you know, my hips started hurting because I was putting too much pressure over here. And when I finally got it fixed, I was like, wow, uh, this is the way my body's supposed to work, right? I was able to, as a matter of fact, yesterday I was up and down off, I was pulling fence posts off of an old fence, and I was up and down off the tractor, and I never once even, even thought about, you got an artificial knee. Everything works. And, and, you know, this knee quit hurting once I got that knee replacement done, got through my rehab, and then lo and behold, when I quit taking all of that pain medication, I found out I needed to get my elbow fixed too. When we work, you know, I almost ran the other day. Whoa, right? You know, when all of our joints work right, that's when the body is functioning. You know, it can, it can go out and scoop up those people who need to know Jesus. When we all work together, but we all have to work together. Because if the elbow don't work, 
you know, it, it's hard. It's hard to scratch your ear if your elbow doesn't work, doesn't it? Isn't it? You know? So when, this, when each thing works together, if that elbow bends, I can reach out and grab something. But, but, you know, the other thing is I have to have my eye on that so that I can see where it is. We all work together. Matter of fact, there's, uh, there's another passage, one of the other passages that talk about the, uh, the gifts, the spiritual gifts. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, and I'll just read a few verses. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, dis- distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one, yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we are all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says... Because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. Is it not for this reason less, any less than a part of the body? And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body. Is it not for this reason, any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? He goes on, but I want to just finish there to to give you just another viewpoint as he looks at the body. And I'm going to use my mama here as an example. The other night the power went out at her house. And uh, mom lives alone. And uh, and, and so uh, in the struggle of trying to get to some place where she could get a flashlight she stubbed her toe. And tore her toenail off. Right? You know, now, Mama, how hard was it to walk the next day? Yeah, you, you, you had to go to the doctor and have the rest of that nail taken out. And, it, and, and if you notice, Mom doesn't walk real well anyway because of some other things. But she's 90 and she's, she's allowed. But that toenail, that toenail... And it affects everything else. Now you may say, well, I, I'm only, the only gift I have is as a big toe. Well, I guarantee you, without that big toe, or if that big toe gets hurt, right, Leo? If the big toe gets hurt, the rest of the body's going to feel it. And until that big toe gets healed, you're going to walk kind of funny. You see, we're all connected. Everybody has a gift. And you may say, oh, but pastor, I'm old. Don't I deserve to just sit back? Nope. Nope. Mike and I, Mike Anderson and I had this exact conversation last, a week ago Thursday, when he first went in the hospital. Mike was saying, Pastor, I just, I just want to go home. I said, I said, Mike, you don't know what God has for you. He may have numbered your days. And a matter of fact, that number of days more was eight. But he had people to, to minister to in the hospital. In those eight days that he lived from that Thursday to that Friday, he had a job to do. He had people to to take care of. I was praying that God would put him right back where he always was, right back there at that front door. But God says, no, Mike, your time's up. It's time to come on home. But until the day he died, he was praying for people. He was ministering to people. He was sharing. He He said, Pastor, when I talked, the last thing I talked to him, he said, thank you. Thank you for the miracle that God gave us so that I could still be here. And the next day he was gone. But see, we don't know when that's going to be. 
And, and the glorious part of it is God's going to use us until the day he's done. The day he's done. Moses. Moses didn't even start his ministry until he was 80 years old. When he was 80, God called him to lead the children of Israel out. He's going to lead them for over 40 more years. He was 120 years old. And it says he was still healthy. And God took him up to the mountain. And he says, okay, Moses, now you can come home. I kind of think sometimes that God did that for me. I started preaching when I was 15 years old, first time I ever preached at my church over in Lebanon. Went to Bible college, and God directed me down a path of law enforcement, and for 31 years, I faithfully served the Lord as a police officer. And I can, clear, I can say to this day, I ministered to more people in my 31 years as a police officer who truly needed to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior than I ever will as long as I preach. Because God put me into places where people who needed Jesus were. And then I retired. And I thought, oh boy, I get to play now. And here's the interesting thing, that 40 years, it was 40 years that God said, I'm going to have you doing something else until I came to pastor this church as a, I was an elder here. Forty years God had put me in, in a different place so that I could, I could be prepared for this ministry. Don't ever count God out. Don't say, okay, God, I want to be in the rocking chair. Because God has something for you. God has something for every one of us. And when we put everything together, we will find that God is going to build his church because that's the way he's designed it. Well, we're going to come to communion now. And... Uh, I'm reminded as we come to communion of what Jesus did. You see, Jesus had his 12 disciples with him. For three and a half years, he poured everything into them. They walked with him everywhere he went. They saw all the miracles he did. He prepared them. And even out of that, one of them betrayed him. Judas. Judas. But even at the Last Supper, Jesus never gave up on Judas. Matter of fact, when he gave the Last Supper, he offered the bread first to Judas. That was a symbol of offering in the Jewish tradition. The bread went to the most favored person first. You see, in the, even in his last example with his disciples, with his apostles. He was looking to Judas and saying, Judas, you don't have to do this. All you have to do is repent and confess. And Judas couldn't do it. And he left. But for those other 11, he said, listen, guys, and, and, and if we, when we looked through the Gospel of John. He said, I've prepared you all of these years. Now I'm going away. And you're going to have to go it alone. But I want you to understand something. I am going to sacrifice everything for you. And because of that, I will be in you for the rest of your lives. I will go with you wherever you go. You will have my power. You will even do greater things than I do because you've been with me. And when we take communion, we are reminded that God is with us.